In this episode, we talk with co-founder of Big Chill Appliances, Orion Kramer. Uh, It's a fascinating story, and I hope you enjoy it. I ran into you a couple years ago. Uh, My company was doing some work with you, and I got to hear a little bit of your story and thought that it would be a fantastic story to share. Uh, We have a lot of entrepreneurs, we have a lot of successful business people, uh, creatives who listen to the show, and um, you are a creative, and you are an entrepreneur, and you're a business person to some extent. You're the president of a company. I mean, you got to make business decisions, right? Sure. Yeah. So I would love uh, if you would just kind of share your story, uh, share a little bit about where you grew up, what your childhood was like, that journey of um, school and, and all that. Yeah. Yeah. Just start from the beginning, huh? Yeah, start from the beginning. Well, I grew up in Kansas. I'm a Midwestern kid. Nice. Um, I would, I'd like to say that I was raised by a pack of wild hippies. Um, <laughs> they have those in Kansas? Yeah, Lawrence is like, it's like the little blue dot in the sea of red. Okay. Um, it's a college town, maybe 100,000 uh, hundred thousand people. Um, yeah, my parents were, were both hippies and I was born in the, in the mid to late seventies. Um, so yeah, I would say I grew up in somewhat of a conventional town, um, with very unconventional parents and, um, yeah. So what was that like? I mean, did you go to school in like tie dye and then all your friends were in like, you know, bum equipment and you're like, Hey, <laughs> what's, um, well, I, let me let me back up from yeah. from there and say that um, I'm a twin. Um, oh. I'm the younger of I'm the younger of the of the two twins, and um, my mom and dad had no idea they were having twins, and we were born at home um, with midwives. And um, you know, you know, why I love this story too because I too was born at home. <laughs> were you with the midwife? <laughs> because my parents too were hippies. I was born in the Florida Keys on a bed. In the 70s? <laughs> no, in the early 80s. Early 80s. Okay. Yeah. yeah okay. Well, similar. Yeah. I was late 70s. But yeah, so my... Um, okay. So because they were hippies, they didn't get ultrasounds and they didn't do all that stuff? No, my mom would say she had a doctor, um, and but the doctor was also very old. Okay. And when when she went in and she, she looked ridiculously large, um, she asked the doctor, Hey, is this a really big child in here or or what's going on? And she said, I only hear one heartbeat in there. And so that's, I think even, even a 10 pound baby. Yeah. Even in the seventies, my mom, you know, if she knew she was having twins, probably, probably would have gone to the hospital to have it because that's just, yeah, you know, it's a, it's a high risk. It's a whole new ball game. Yeah. With two babies in there. So, so, so so my, my twin brother is, he came out first, he came out first and, you know, we're out in the country. We're not even in town. We're out in basically a barn and, um, he's born, he's seven and a half pounds and wow, that's a big baby for a twin. Yeah. Born at (laughs) about 11 o'clock at night. And, uh, my dad says, uh, when he's telling me the story, he says, Hey, the, the midwives come back 20 minutes later and they say, Julie, we think there's another baby in there. <laughs> so, so your brother was born. Everyone's like, oh man, glad that's over. Let's enjoy our baby. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, wait a second, but yeah. wait, there's more. <laughs> yeah. We think, we think there's another baby in there. So I'm, I'm born an hour and a half later. So they have twins. They're totally have no idea that's coming. And then we're, we have different birthdays. So he's born on October 10th oh. and I'm born on October 11th. How cool is that? Yeah. I know a couple of twins and they're always like resented like that they had to share their birthday and they had to, you know, it's like yeah. everything was shared, but look at that. You get your own day. Yeah. So, I mean, we grew up as twins, but in, in some ways we just felt more like brothers than, yeah. than twins. I mean, I think we were competitive like twins, but. Are you guys like identical, identical? No, we're fraternal. Oh, okay. Nice. We're so you fraternal. look different. Yeah, we look, you wouldn't even, if you walked in, you would, you wouldn't know we're even brothers. Now, do you, do you have any other? Siblings? Yeah. We've got a younger brother um, who lives here in Denver. Oh, okay. Nice. Yeah. So what was that like growing up as a twin? Um, you know, I th- what I like about being a twin is you're learning to share everything, you know, from from day one. And so that, that comes easily. Um, 
What I don't like about it is, you know, I thought, I think we were very competitive kids Mm -hmm. growing up and, um, you know, whether it was doing chores or sports or hobbies, I mean, everything, everything became a competition in, in, in a way that I'm not sure that it's, it's like that with identical twins, but, um, at least this is my theory that fraternal twins are, are very competitive and, and end up, both of us have gone in very different directions. We're both creative, but creative types, but, um, I'd say we're yeah very different. He's fully sleeved in tattoos and builds custom Harley Davidson motorcycles and, um, yeah. He's, You're like the he's, he's, he's a cool guy, but um, but I would say we're very different. You know, I'm I'm more like yeah, more the the straight family man. Mm-hmm. Yeah, at this point. Yeah. So um, wow. So you're born at home on yeah. a bed yeah. with a twin, and they only had one name picked out. So they named my twin brother Lucas. He got the normal name. He got the normal name. I don't. I'm not sure Lucas was normal in back then. 1976. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> It, I think it is. It's probably pretty normal now. But George Lucas. That's right. Yeah. So they, yeah, they would tell you they were lying out under the stars and they didn't have a name for a few days. And uh, yeah, they were lying out under the stars and saw Orion's belt. And have all, they always love that constellation. And that's, yeah, that's where I got my name. Nice. A yeah. constellation. Yeah. I, I love the name now. I mean, yeah. Everybody remembers who you are. Um, and, you know, in a lot of ways, it's good to be unique. At the time, you know, growing up in Kansas, I mean, I, I never met another person named Orion until I was until I moved to Boulder, Colorado. Yeah, and, and here. yeah. Growing up in Kansas, like Billy and John and you know Mike and yeah, Tom. So, <laughs> I always just wanted to be a normal kid. Um, you know, most teachers struggled to pronounce your name. A lot of kids struggled to pronounce your name. Most people just assumed you were a weirdo. You know, yeah, in Kansas with the name Orion, but. But now, yeah, I, I love it now. Um, yeah, I, I lived with my hippie mom until I was 10. Yeah. And um, she she called me Shiloh. That was my my name. That was your given name? No. That no. was my, that you know, so my dad named me after him. I'm Mark Edward Labriola II. Yeah. All right. Yeah. My mom, you know, she didn't prefer that name. She's like, I want you to be Shiloh. Yeah. You look, and, you look like a Shiloh right now. <laughs> yeah, thank you. And so, you know, I, I remember her coming to school to pick me up in elementary and be like, Shiloh. And I'm like, like don't <laughs> call me Shiloh in public. <laughs> Is that why you're so straight now? There's yeah. Like, that rejection of, <laughs> of your mom being so weird. Yeah, I don't know. Weird, maybe. Weird, maybe in a good way. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. So then, so then how long did you live in Kansas? I mean, did you grow up there like K through 12? Yeah. I grew up okay. in Kansas. Um, yeah. From start to finish or, or till I was 18 till I went off to college and I haven't been back since. I mean, I go back to visit. My right. mom still lives there, but, okay. um, yeah, I'm a Midwesterner for sure. Yeah. So then did you find, was it a struggle then? I mean, did you get bullied a lot, uh, you know, kind of living in a counter culture community or, you know, home and then going into, I mean, Kansas, <laughs> I would say me and my brothers all learned how to adapt and we're all somewhat socially aware mm-hmm. and, and figured out how to, um, how to not be that kid who, who got bullied. You know, we went, we, we grew up in, yeah, with a lot of diversity, um, racial and economic diversity in, in our part of town. And you just had to be able to get along with, with lots of different people. And, um, so I think, I think we all learned how to, you know, duck and weave, mm-hmm. um, all the bullying. Yeah. And it kind of just kind of shaped you and mold you to, into who you are. Yeah. You know, I, to add to all that, I mean, we, we also grew up very poor, um, on, and, and, and a lot of people would say poor by choice could, because both my parents had college degrees, but, um, yeah, grew up very poor, grew up on food stamps. And, um, at the time when you're, you know, when you're four or five years old, you just, you just assume that that's how everybody lives. And mm-hmm. so it seemed, it all seemed normal to us, um, at the time, but, but yeah, I think, I think that really shaped us. Yeah. Now you say poor by choice. Uh, what did your parents do as like trade? Yeah. Um, well, my dad, um, my dad was started his own plumbing company. He was a plumber for other people for a number of years and then started his own company and did that for a while. Um, you know, that, that didn't end up working out for him in the end. He didn't, he didn't love having his own business, but, but yeah, he was a plumber. 
Um, my mom mostly, I would say mostly did, did odd jobs and worked in restaurants. Um, yeah, but you know, she was very young. My mom, my dad was 30 when I was born and she was, she was only 23, mm. you know, and she had two, three kids, um, at home by herself. Um, so she was, she was busy doing that as well. Nice. Yeah. What, when you were young, did you have aspirations of being an entrepreneur or, I mean, did you start your own like lawn mowing business or were you just pretty average kid? You know, when you were able to work, did you just get a job at, at the local Dairy Queen or? <laughs> you know, I didn't, I didn't have big dreams at all. And I don't, I think a lot of kids in Kansas would probably say that the same thing. We didn't know really what was out there in the world. Um, so I think I, at one point I wanted to be, I know I wanted to be an architect when I was, when I was younger and that was, and that would, would have been, you know, the highlight because I didn't, I really didn't know even what was out there. I'm a product designer now, but I'd never even heard that term until I was, you know, 22 years old. So, um, when I was a kid, yeah, I wanted to be an architect. I, I didn't even really know what it meant to be an entrepreneur. Um, until I, you know, I, I had a, a mentor growing up, which was my uncle. Um, so this is my mom's little, little brother and, uh, he's not, he's not little anymore, but, um, he started a clothing company when he was in his, in his mid twenties. And, um, he had a great wife. He lived in California. He took lots of vacations and always just seemed to be a really cool guy. And, and, you know, I know, you know, by the age of four or five years old, um, I didn't know what I liked about that guy, but I, th I thought he was great. And so I latched on to him as a kid. I didn't see him a lot because um, he lived in California. But when I would see him at family reunions and all that, um, I would just try and spend as much time as I could with him. You're like, yeah, this guy's cool. Yeah, he was, he was really cool. So I w but, but that said, I, it, it never crossed my mind that that was, you know, really attainable for me. Um, I didn't, I, I couldn't figure out how you would get from point A to point B. Um, you know, another, another, I would say a, a turning point for me was maybe when I was 13 going to visit him and my aunt in Long Beach, um, with my, with my two brothers and my mom was there as well, but she was at a, at a trade show, I believe. So, um, yeah, we, First of all, I'd never been to California, went out there, flew into LAX and went to uh, Long Beach. He, you know, he picks us up in his, in his vintage car and we go to the beach and we hang out at his house and um, we go to Disneyland, do all the fun stuff. And, and I think that was a turning point where me and my brothers all would probably say, wow, I didn't know this, this whole world existed. I thought, you know, you know, you live in a small town and you grow up and you, you know, work at the fast food restaurant and that's what you do. And you <laughs> the Taco married. John. Hit the ta yeah, there was a Taco John's. <laughs> there always is. And it's I think, like you can't find a Taco John, but as soon as you go through a small town, there's a Subway, a Dairy Queen and a Taco John. Yeah. I think my twin brother worked at maybe it was either Taco John's or, or Taco Bell. I don't, I'm not sure I was qualified to work there, but, but yeah, I worked in fast food and I worked at a snow cone shop and, um, yeah. Again, I didn't, I didn't have big dreams. Um, I would say my biggest dream growing up was to play, um, college soccer because I couldn't figure out any other way that I was going to be able to go to college and, and pay for it and do all that. So that was, so you had soccer. Yeah. When so you were I in high school, I had, I had soccer probably started when I was in first grade and, okay. and, went, and uh, yeah, went all the way. I still play soccer. Nice. Yeah. Helps you stay fit. Yeah. It, it does a lot. It's done a lot of stuff for me. Um, but yeah, at the age of, at the age of 42, that's, that's the best thing about it right now is, you know, there's the community of your buddies on the team, but yeah, it's, it's staying fit. Yeah. It's the biggest, biggest plus at this point. Yeah. My wife was a division one soccer player in college. Where was she? Yeah. Where'd she play? She played, uh, at Campbell university, which is in North, North Carolina. Yeah. I've heard of that. The Campbell camels. Yeah. yeah. And, and do your kids all play soccer now? Um, yeah, it's funny. Uh, my middle son plays soccer. Okay. Uh, my oldest son was like, nah. Um, and then my daughter, she has like the natural ability. Like I see her like dribble a ball. I'm like, dang girl, like yeah. you're only six. And so we're trying to get her into it. Re my wife, she's really like bummed that no one's like, like drawn to it and like super yeah. in love with it yet, but yeah. maybe that'll change. So yeah, six is pretty, pretty young, but yeah, even if, even if one of the three kids did it, I mean, it, 
both of my daughters play. They're both pretty young. They're seven, seven and eleven, or eight and eleven. But but yeah, at least I know for dads, for myself especially, it's it's pretty rewarding to be able to kick the ball around. Yeah, my wife she coaches my my middle son's team. Oh, good. But she she tore ACL her junior year, and now she's just so afraid to like because I keep telling her like you should join a you know like all women's club or you know some yeah. some something. Yeah. But she's just afraid that she's gonna like blow out a knee or something. Yeah, I've done that twice, Oof. but I, I haven't figured out anything else to do. I never, I did never um, had any other hobbies growing up. So that was soccer was like you kind of fell in love with it then at, at, a, at a young age. And did were you on any pretty decent teams? Um, I mean, there weren't a lot of decent teams in in Kansas. We were we were like let's call it a suburb of Kansas City, and we would. I was a goalkeeper, still am, and we would go to Kansas City and just get you know killed every weekend. <laughs> but but it was a blessing as a goalkeeper I got lots of shots and um yeah I loved it but for me I, I was I guess I was that poor kid and that's how I f- that, that for me that was the way to get out of out of I don't know out of poverty or yeah it was my meal ticket yeah so then were you essentially good enough to get a scholarship for college then um I played division three soccer so okay. in Indiana and and they didn't have um athletic scholarships but but I got because we were a poor family, I got, you know, just a ton of aid. So I didn't, I didn't pay a lot of money to go to college. Nice. And so then going to college, was that you, you were essentially going to college for soccer? Like, or did you have a grander idea? Like, oh, I'm going to study to be an architect. Mm-hmm. No, I was, you know, I had originally, I would planned to just go to the local university, University of Kansas. And, you know, kind of towards the end of the year, um, I got recruited by, um, let's call it a, a small hippie college, Earlham College in Richmond, Indiana. Um, maybe it was 1,200 students. It was smaller than my high school. Um, but I went there with my mom in the summer, and, and we both kind of fell in love with it. It was, it was small. Um, you know, in, in, in the community, part of college, of that college, was, was very important. And, and she probably knew it more than I did at the time, but, you know, she, she insisted on me on me going there. And, um, one of the drawbacks was they didn't have architecture, but you know, I decided at the time I could, I'd, I'd figure that part out later. Mm -hmm. So I went there, um, originally thought, Hey, I'll do economics because that was the closest thing. They didn't have business there either. So, um, I did that for about a semester and realized that that was a terrible decision for me. And, um, I'd taken a couple art classes and, this would be another mentor of mine. She, she sat me down one day and said, Hey, you know, I realize that this isn't the path you're headed down now. Um, but you know, I think that you should give it a go. I don't know why this can't be your, your major in college. You know, I, I realize that you don't want to be a poor painter on the, on the you know side of the street selling, selling artwork one at a time, but just do this. Trust me that it'll all work out. You'll figure out something to do with it. Um, when you're older. So mm. I, I jumped into art, which was the, which was the closest thing to me um, for architecture or whatever I was going to do later. Wow. So that was, seems like a, like a, a pivotal moment, right? That someone would speak into your life right then and say, Hey, like this is the second best choice. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. I, I really appreciated her saying that. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not sure you would get that at a big school. I guess it's possible too, but you know, this was, yeah, this was a professor who, um, who took an interest in, and convinced me that, you know, you make a decision, you do what you can do. You know, what, what I liked about art is I, I, I disliked most of my other classes, but I could sit in the studio for, you know, 40 hours a week, no problem. And, and just paint or draw or, or do whatever it was. And I didn't, it, it wasn't, it wasn't stressful for me. So mm. I figured that was a good thing. I would just go in that direction and, and let the rest sort it out. Yeah. Yeah. So then four years. Yeah. And for, for college. Yeah. And, and how was your time in school? I mean, pretty, pretty average. It was great. I loved college. Those are still some of my best friends in the world. Um, a lot of them are guys I played soccer with. Um, but yeah, we still have a, a very tight community of, of friends from that school and, and we all graduated and, um, I moved out to Boulder, Colorado, um, the day I graduated with my now wife. Oh, okay. So you met your wife in college and then you guys had said, Hey, let's go to Boulder. 
Yeah, I think all my, all my friends were going. Um, a lot of them were starting a band together. They were going to New York City. They were going to, well, maybe it was Memphis. Um, but but I had a girlfriend that was was very serious at the time. We 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 hadn't talked marriage, but you know I wasn't I wasn't willing to let that go. And so Boulder was a great. It was just a great neutral spot for us. I I grew up going there a lot in the summers because I had an aunt and uncle there, and she one of her best friends lived in Boulder. So we just decided we'd give it a summer, see if we liked it. And, um, yeah, here we are. I think it's been, I think it's 20 years this May. Wow. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. I graduated at a great time in 1999. Um, quickly got a job with an architect, just, um, small architecture shop. I didn't know anything about architecture, but I was willing to take his kids to the orthodontist and take out his trash when he was out of town <laughs> and, you know, get coffee for everybody. Literally that, you know, I was, I was a gopher. And, yeah. But I sat in there and one of the guys taught me AutoCAD, um, in his free time. And I, um, it took me about a year of, you know, just being a gopher. And then I, I learned how to do AutoCAD and, um, started you know, designing a bathroom here and there, small projects um, for the architecture company. And did you, did you fall in love with that? So when you went from, from college, you went to Boulder. Yeah. You had a degree in art. Yep, a degree in fine art. Okay, degree in fine art. And so when you get to Boulder, what was the idea as far as like, I'm going to get a job at, you know, the local sandwich shop and intern or... Did you already have a job lined up? Did you know somebody? Um, I wasn't willing. I don't think I was ever wanting to get a job at a sandwich shop. I actually, I did work at a number of restaurants, but um, yeah, I, I had, I had an aunt and uncle, I had two sets of aunts and uncles um, who lived in Boulder. And um, so I, I used those connections at the beginning. And one of them was great friends with an architect and it was a small company and he wasn't paying much. So I, I would say I was an intern. I mean, I may have been making eight bucks an hour. Yeah. Um, but it was, a. It, I didn't care for me. It was my foot in the door and I figured yeah. I was going to be an architect and this was the way for me to do it. Um, I was, I didn't want to go right back into school, but I thought this was a good way to try it out and, and see if I liked it. And, you know, I, I still, still really do love architecture, but, um, one of my mentors there, um, at the company, she sat me down one day and said, man, you don't want to be an architect. Don't do it. <laughs> Bro, this job sucks. And I said, I said, why? I'm making eight dollars an hour. I'm about to make ten dollars an hour. What, what, what's the problem? And she said, you never. And, and not that I, I'm. I try not to be too materialistic, but Boulder isn't the cheapest place to live. And she said, you're never going to make any money, and you're going to spend ninety five percent of your time, you know, making red line changes for somebody else, and and only five percent of your time is going to be done, is going to be actually designing. Um, so, in my opinion, you know you've got some good talent, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't waste it on be, becoming an architect. Have you ever thought about product design? And I had never heard of it. They don't, you know, I'm, I'm not, they didn't have it at my high school or I just never heard of it. So, um, I immediately looked into it and found just a local city college in Denver, um, that had it. And I was able to keep working at the architect office and take some classes in the meantime. Um, because I already had an, an undergraduate degree, I only had to take uh, two years of classes. Okay. So, yeah, I'm I'm sitting in product design school, and I, I love it. It was it's it's a it's a much better fit for me. Um, not that architecture isn't, but um, it's it's a good fit. That you're always doing lots of new projects um, all at once, and and there's plenty and there's a lot of lots of design. Um, what do you, what do you think drew you to architecture? I mean, because it sounded like as a young kid, you were like, oh, I want to be an architect. Like, what do you think drew you to that? You know, I don't, I don't, I never really fit in with the artists, um, with the, with the fine artists at school, just culturally. Um, I mean, we all got along and we were friends, but I never fit in with engineers as well. So I was, you know, I kind of sat somewhere in between. Um, and I feel, feel like architects and product designers, a lot of them are, you know, you're, you're part artist, but but you can't be a, just a complete artist and really probably be that successful in that field. So, you know, there's some engineering involved. Um, you know, you have to be a somewhat practical person to, to design a refrigerator that, or a blender or a toaster that, that actually works and it doesn't just look nice. So 
I don't know. Um, socially, I've always got along really well with architects and product designers. Nice. Yeah. And then uh, still dating. Was your girlfriend at the time working a job? Like you guys living together, trying to make things work? Yeah. I think when we first moved out to Boulder, she got a job. I remember it at Costco for a month or two, giving out food samples. She probably loved me telling that story. <laughs> Would you like to try this sample, sir? But no, she, she's super sharp and she got a job at the university in the admissions office um, at the University of Colorado and, and stayed there for a long time. Nice. Yeah. yeah. Nice. Um, so then you go to Denver to, to get your degree in product design. Yeah. And that was kind of heads down, just working essentially to get that degree Commuting from Boulder to Denver, going to school, yep. going home, interning at the architecture firm, yeah. kind of just living that life for a couple of years. Yeah. So in the background, you know, um, my my uncle who was in my aunt and uncle who were in the in the fashion world, um, we were all we were all very close, and um, I know he had always he was always looking out for opportunities, you know, where we could, we could he could help me start a business. I think. Um, I'm not sure he told me that at the time, but he must've been thinking that. Um, so his first idea was that we should start a, a Vespa shop and we would, um, we would build our own Vespa or something that looks similar to a Vespa, um, and have a motorcycle shop and we rent them and we sell them and we do them in lots of cool colors. And, um, and I liked the idea, but, but I didn't love the idea and, um, I liked it, but I didn't love it. Are yeah. you pretty handy mechanical? Like, um, build stuff with your hands. I, I don't think my buddies in Kansas would. I would say I'm pretty mechanical or handy, but but definitely in Boulder, Colorado, I'd be considered pretty handy. <laughs> in yeah. comparison, yeah, it's all relative. <laughs> yeah, um, my twin brother's a lot a lot handier than I am, but I do in, enjoy parts of engineering. Um, so so his next idea he quickly came up with was well, let's. You know, they're building this house out in California and they want it, they want it to feel like an old beach house. They don't want it to be a modern house. And um, my aunt's asking, you know, well, what kind of fridge are we going to put in there? An, an old vintage fridge. And this was a vacation home for them and they didn't, um, they weren't going to be there that often. So um, I think the idea popped up that somebody should be making fridges that look old, but they're new on the inside. And so they came to me with that idea. And I, I just happened to love vintage, vintage stuff, but vintage refrigerators in particular. When I was, when I was, uh, in art school or getting my degree in art, I would collect vintage refrigerator doors, um, on the wall and use them as pieces of art because they're big and they're kind of, um, you know, they're very architectural and, and it, it's, it's a big, cheap piece of art for me. So I, yeah. I loved, I loved the designs. Um, and so when he came to me with that idea 2000 or 2001, we, we ran with it. So I, if it was finishing school, I was working for an architect and then we were kind of moonlighting with this product and, um, yeah, the rest is history. Wow. So when he came to you and he said, Hey, do you think you could do this? I mean, is, is that pretty much how he approached you? Like, Hey, we should do this vintage fridge thing Were you kind of like, yeah, like, let's try it out. Like, mm -hmm. You know, I know how to use AutoCAD. I was, I was a lot more nervous than that. You know, he's, he's the kind of guy who's willing to, you know, jump first and ask questions later. And, and I, you know, if I was being honest, I would have said, well, I should, I like the idea, but I should probably get a real job and learn how to be a real product designer first. And, you know, I, I haven't even graduated from college in product design. Um, so, um, it, it took a big leap, but I didn't have a lot to lose either. You know, I didn't have like a great job um, and I wasn't supporting a family. So it was looking back, it was a great time to take some risk. And I did, I had, I had a lot of free time um, again, cause I had no kids or, or I didn't have that many responsibilities, just a girlfriend at the time. So, um, but, but I, I wouldn't say I was like born to be an entrepreneur or like mm -hmm. super confident at the time. You know, I, I I would tell him now, you know, I, I wanted to quit a thousand times. Um, you know, there was at one point a, a supplier, a major supplier that we were using came to us and said, you know, we don't want you to use our product. Product, um, you know, here's a cease and desist letter. 
And I said, well, that was it. That's it. That was fun. <laughs> we gave it a good college try. <laughs> and my uncle says, my, you know, his first reaction is, well, no, I'm just going to call the guy. So he calls up this lawyer and, you know, within five minutes, you know, they're talking about family and, um, and they're both laughing. And, and he says, you know what, what you guys are doing is pretty cool. Just change this and this and, and, and we're going to leave you alone, you know, and oh. stuff that, stuff that you don't necessarily know to, you don't know to ask those kind of questions when you're, when you're 22 years old. Right. Um, so th- those were the, the learning moments, but, but he pushed through when I was, when I was ready to quit many times and, and, and I'll always appreciate that. Yeah. So did you guys, before you started the company, did you guys have some prototypes or did you like test it out? Try, mm-hmm. See if this thing would even work. Did he get a fridge for his beach house? Mm. So yeah, we're both from Kansas. He grew up there as well. And so I'm just telling you that just so you know that we're cheap. Yeah, we don't, <laughs> we don't like to, we, neither of us wanted to spend a ton of money getting this company going. So we bought, you know, bought, went to Home Depot and bought a few fridges, went to, I remember Home Depot and got like that, you know, dense, dense foam and then just glued the foam onto the fridge and kind of came up with a shape that we liked um, and did that a few times, went to the junkyard a bunch of times, found, you know, fa- found a handle here that we like and a, and a, you know, some chrome trim here that we liked and a logo here that we liked. Um, but, you know, we did it all. I guess, I guess that looking back, I'd say we were pretty scrappy. Yeah. And um, did a, made a prototype. And then, you know, once it was time to get serious and we had come up with the designs, we happened to find, you know, an engineer who used to work at Whirlpool and he was comfortable designing refrigerators or the outsides of refrigerators. So, and then, um, you know, we called around and figured out, you know, a guy who could help us get this whole thing made and, um, you know, that was, that was a long process in itself, but, but we persevered and, and, uh, it took about maybe three, four years after that to get it going. We sold our first one in 2004. Okay. Yeah. Who, and who, who bought that? Just some a neighbor, oh, a really? neighbor who we had a prototype out on, out of my uncle's front porch and we were just building it. A guy walks by and says, wow, that's the coolest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> walks back home and brings his checkbook back and, and bought a fridge right there on the spot. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. So really your uncle, I mean, he kind of pushed you into this thing, right? Um, he didn't push me like saying, hey, you've got to do this. Right, but, but it was like, all right. like. But he was like, hey, you're not going to get these that many opportunities like this in your life. And, um, you know, an uncle who's willing to, you know, loan you a bunch of money to to start a company and, and be your mentor, um, yeah, looking back, um, yeah, you don't get a lot of those chances in life. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, were there times that you were scared or like you said you wanted to give up? It was like cease and desist letter and you're like, <laughs> all right, like I'm out. Like w- yeah. did did you like go to bed stressed and like fearful? Like maybe I should just go get a job and like work for somebody. And Yeah. I mean, it was stressful getting the thing off the ground. And then once once we actually got it off the ground, you know, having to switch gears and learn how to sell a product. Um, you know, that's not something they teach you in art school either. Uh, that was, that was super scary. I mean, there was, there was a couple of times when I was, yeah, on my knees crying and, um, and I don't, I don't cry that often, yeah, but, but it was very stoic. Yeah. But I was, it was, it was very stressful. Yeah. When you're 23, 24 years old and you've got the weight of the world on your shoulders and, right. um, you know, you've got customers, you've sold fridges to, and you can't figure out how to make it. Um, you know, the, those are the moments that were, that were pretty stressful. I mean, they're laughable now, but, but I had, yeah, I had sold, let's just say five, 10 refrigerators and, um, the prototypes weren't even ready. And I thought I was optimistic and thought they would be. And, you know, I'd given everybody my cell phone number and, you know, I was getting calls all the time. Where's, where, my, where's fridge? my refrigerator? You've got my money. Um, and, and this you know, was like all pre Kickstarter out. and like, yeah, Kickstarter didn't <laughs> exist at the time. <laughs> right. So, so, you know, I learned a lot of lessons there and, and now I try and under promise and over deliver. Yeah. That's a good, and, and I don't give out my cell phone number. <laughs> to, to the random people. Yeah. So at what point did you feel like, Oh wow. I, like, I think this is going to work or, you know, yeah. Um, 
you know, I, I can't say how many fridges we sell now, but I know the first year we sold a hundred refrigerators. And just word of mouth or did you have like a website up? Yeah, we had a website and, okay. and my uncle had, had a lot of vision. I would say, you know, he was in the fashion industry um, or apparel world and he, he didn't love how it was set up because you had, you had salespeople you had to pay, you had distributors you had to pay there. You had retailers you had to pay. There was just a lot of, yeah. a lot of mouths to feed. And he thought it would be brilliant for us to start um, an appliance company where, where you didn't have all those channels and you went direct to the customer as much as possible. And, and not like there was a lot of shopping carts at the time, but, but just to create a business model where you've got 20 or 30 dealers instead of 600, 800 dealers across the United States. And um, you're selling through those dealers. People can come and see the product, but for the most part you're selling direct and that, that um, helped us, you know, uh, helped us get started. We didn't have to sell, you know, a thousand fridges a year to, to make money and, and, and pay him back. And we were able to, you know, spend that extra money on our brand and, and all that. So, um, that was, that was probably one of the best decisions we made. And at the same time, it's, it's easy to market a red refrigerator. You know, it's not like yeah trying to get magazines to pick up your toilet seat covers. You know, it's, it's, it was easy to get press from day one. So, um, and, and no one was doing anything like this. No, you know, a company started at, at, at a similar time to us. They probably got to market a, a bit quicker than us, but, um, but yeah, at the time, yeah, we felt like we were, we were pioneering, you know, colorful appliances. We would go to these trade shows and everything was black and white and stainless. And, and, um, you know, we, we had a, we had a hunch that people were, were willing to, to put color in their kitchen. They just, just needed a company to provide that. Mm. And so you start getting some steam where you, you sell a hundred fridges your first year. And then we sold 300 fridges the next year and, and never had dreams of, of, of getting as big as we, as we, we are now. But, but I figured even at 300 fridges, you know, we had, we had something, you know, it was, that was even bigger than I thought we would ever do, you know, my, my main goal was just to pay my uncle back and, um, you know, and then everything else was gravy on top of that. And, and we were able to do that in, you know, in 18 months. So, wow. That's pretty crazy. Yeah. So I paid him back and, and, and then we almost immediately started getting requests for dishwashers and microwaves and everything else. And so that's the company kept growing from there. Mm. Yeah. And, and so, Cause I know you guys get featured in magazines all the time. Like celebrities love your guys' product. And so, you know, was there anybody who ever bought a fridge from you that you're like, Oh my gosh. <laughs> um, yeah, there were a lot of, there were a lot of, um, celebrities at the beginning that, that bought from us. I don't, um, I'm not sure all of them would want me to say their names, but I remember one day at towards the beginning, um, Francis McDormand, um, you know, she's married to Jill Cohen and, um, she's been in a lot of great movies called and you're actually speaking to her and, um, you know, she ordered, she was one of our first customers and pretty quickly after that, I remember Miranda Lambert calling in and, and telling me who she was and she was buying a kitchen for her parents. And, um, yeah, those moments kind of kept you going and, and, and made it all worth it. Mm. Yeah. Wow. So, um, so you kind of grew the company, you know, from that time you grew it and grew it. And then, um, you guys got acquired, right? Yeah. By a bigger company. Yeah. How did, how did that all go down? And uh, like, what was that time like? Yeah. I mean, were you feeling like, man, I, I've kind of reached terminal velocity as far as, you know, my bandwidth and stuff. And I need kind of someone to come along and, and help me. Yeah. You know, it was, it was about 10 years ago and, um, we were doing fridges, we were doing dishwashers and we really, really needed a, you know, to start getting into the cooking business. And, um, my uncle was willing to invest the money, but, you know, picture being 26, 27 years old. And, um, I paid my uncle back and, you know, we were on great terms and you know, I wasn't jumping up and down to, you know, borrow millions of dollars. Um, yeah, it's scary <laughs> from him to start a stove line that may or may not work. And, um, 
so a company came along, a larger stove company came along and, and, um, and said, Hey, we're, we're interested in, in acquiring you. We can help you get into stoves and whatever else you want to get, get into. So it, it was, I mean, in, in a lot of ways that, that timing was perfect because I've got to stay, um, stay on and, and lead the company. Um, but I've got a lot of resources to design whatever I want. And, you know, I'm not borrowing the money from my aunt and uncle, you know, I, I always thought that would be weird showing up to family reunions when you owe your uncle $2 million and, and you've only sold seven stoves in a year. It's like, so how are sales coming? You're like, could you pass the mashed potatoes? So I like taking some risk, but yeah, but I, for me it was a way to take some of the chips off the table and, and continue to play. Yeah. Yeah. So it's been a great fit. Um, and we've been able to grow the company tremendously yeah. since then. So do you feel, um, do you feel like you ever miss just making fridges in your garage, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. You, you know, I, I don't feel, I feel pretty detached from, from being, being that artist. Um, but you know, on the side, on the side on Saturdays, um, I work on my house and, and my dad and I get together every Saturday and, you know, we dig holes and build fences and, and do stuff that doesn't take a lot of, um, doesn't take a lot of skill, but, but, but quite a bit of art. And, and so I feel like I'm getting that, you know, I'm getting to be an artist, um, with houses and, um, that's, you know, that, that's given me the artistic outlet, you know, aside from designing the next blender or toaster. Yeah. So how do you, how do you stay inspired? I mean, because part of your job, right, is is the brainchild of what are we doing next, yeah. you know? And so how do you keep yourself fresh or how do you stay inspired? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I would say I would say I don't I don't struggle to come up with with appliances because, you know, the company that we are acquired by acquired by, um, you know, they're happy to let me do whatever I want. There's not a lot of restrictions. I mean, I, I just naturally have no interest in designing um, a refrigerator if you're only, only going to sell five of them. So I'm, I, I kind of, my mind just from, as a business person is, is always looking to design stuff that is both different, but that you're actually going to sell, sell some. Um, so I, I don't, I wouldn't say there's ever, um, ever a point where I don't feel like there's enough to do. I mean, I could, if, if we go through the kitchen and do all that stuff and, and, and everybody loves that, then we'll just move on to, you know, the living room or the outdoors or, you know, we, we all love metal and we love color. And, and I feel like there's a lot of, a lot of ways you can go with that. Yeah. Yeah. How was building a team or, you know, obviously you, you work, you have employees and, and stuff like that. I mean, did you get to pull in some of your friends at all or did you just put a post on Craigslist like, or, you know, in the newspaper. <laughs> yeah. Some like, of my closest hey. friends in the world were my first employees and, and that was great. I guess I got to help them out at a time when they needed, um, to fill up some time and, and make some money. Um, but yeah, it was, it was also very, very helpful for me to, to be able to rely on friends at the beginning. But I would say within, within the first year, I think we all realized that it's best to hire people that, you know, that you didn't go to college with or high school with. You can have that detachment from, you yeah. know, you can say, when I have to be a jerk, <laughs> yeah, I can be a jerk and not ruin my friendship. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so um, those are good times when we, we can laugh about unloading the first container of, of product, um, you know, with your, with your college buddy or, you know, one of your other friends building refrigerators in a, in an unheated warehouse you know, <laughs> in the middle of winter. Those are good. Those are funny stories now, but they weren't at the time. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, wh- I mean, what what's next for you? Think. I mean, what what is what what inspires you and and kind of keeps driving you? I mean, you say you're working on your home and yeah. stuff like that. I mean, uh, do you ever feel like you want to tackle something else bigger or? Um. Yeah. What do you want to do in your forties? I. I I don't, I don't, I don't know. I don't have, I don't have huge dreams. I'm trying to keep my life simple. I've got, you know, two kids and, and we're in the golden years of, you know, 
of, of them growing up. I know they're not going to be around forever. So I'm trying to stay focused on my family and, you know, working on Saturdays with my dad and, and friends, um, you know, on house projects is, it keeps me, keeps me plenty busy and I'm in, and keeps me creative, um, you know, along with all the design stuff I can do at work. So I don't know. I feel pretty balanced right now. Yeah. And, and I don't, I don't know. I don't have, I don't have huge dreams. Do you, do you feel pressure at all? Um, you know, as a leader, mm-hmm. like, do you feel pressure of like having to constantly grow or, you know? Yeah. And a lot of that is, is pressure I put on myself. And cause you know, we've, we've been doing it for 50, between 15 and 20 years and we've grown on average, you know, 22, 23, 24% a year, you know, for, um, almost 20 years straight. And so, yeah, I've got, I put a lot of pressure on myself, you know, the owners, um, yeah, there's always pressure from, from them as well. But, you know, I think we're all, we're all just kind of competitive people, um, who are running the business and, so yeah, that is, but, but you know what, it always works out every year. And even if you're a little bit slow, you know, the first six months of one year, I, th- I think that for me that it's always stressful, but I, some of my bet, my best ideas or our best ideas have come from, from times when, when business isn't going as well, it forces, forces you to get creative. Mm. And, um, so I don't, I don't, I don't necessarily mind those periods now. It was very stressful for me when I was 25 and we had slow periods, but, but now, um, at this age, I've, I've been through enough of them. I know that, I know that they're going to pass and it's going to force you to do something creative. Yeah. Um, man, this is, this is interesting. This is awesome. Um, what do you, what do you do for fun? Like with your family? I mean, what do you, you say you work on your home, yeah. you got kids in soccer. I mean, you live like a, just a dad life. <laughs> yeah. I would say I'm living that, you know, the bolder dad life. Yeah. And, um, yeah, put in the work, but then I'll go after, you know, my, my eldest daughter is, is a goalkeeper as well. And so nice. after this, you know, I'll go home, um, pick her up and we'll go train. Um, and so I, yeah, I get a lot of satisfaction out of that. Um, just being able to spend time with her and then I'll go home and I'll kick the ball. We have, we have a set up a soccer goal in our living room. Nice. Um, so I'll go kick the ball with my, with my younger daughter then. And, um, I don't know. We'll spend some time at home. The girls will read a lot or do their homework and spend time with their mom. But I would say we, we keep that pretty simple and, and that's, I don't know, that's enough for me. Yeah. yeah. That's awesome. Um, what about, I want to hear some of your, your, uh, like things as far as favorite food, like, you know, what do you love to eat? You know where I went on the way, on the way here. I always, if I can, I can, I squeeze in a stop at this place called tacos y salsas. It's just a taco shop you know, right on federal. Oh, and I, I don't know. Is it right off of highway 36? Um, there's a couple, one of them is fairly close to federal and, and 36. And I, I stopped there, but I think there's another one here kind of South federal. Oh. So just, I don't know, street food, nothing, nothing super wild, but it, you know, for the most part, I, I really don't eat that much meat. And so, yeah, you live in Boulder. I mean, hello. Well, I was raised, <laughs> I was raised from zero to five as a vegetarian. Yeah. You, you know, Me too. Pack, know. A pack of wild hippies. Yeah. That's why like, people are like, why do you like tofu and soy milk? I'm like, I don't know, but I do. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's like, have you ever had tofu chicken nuggets, man? There's something about them. <laughs> I haven't had those. Really? Oh, so good. So I, yeah, I guess for me, I try and think of meat as a treat and have it yeah. as a side dish and not, not just getting after it every night. Yeah. No, I, uh, I agree with you. I, I feel how like. How do you eat? Yeah, we we call ourselves flexitarians. Oh, I like that. Yeah, so um, you know, we try to have a balanced diet. Um, try to have fish at least once a week, yep. and then we try to eat vegetarian once or twice a week. Yep. And then I I don't think consuming too much meat. I, I think consuming too much meat is just bad for you, your health, and it's bad for the environment. Yep. You know all those things. So I always just say like, try to eat responsibly. Yeah. You know. Yeah. I think the world's headed in that direction. Flexitarian. Flexitarian. There you go. It's like, you know, cause I have some friends who are, are vegetarian and it's always a downer channel. You like when they go somewhere and then it's like, Oh, like I can't eat cause there's, you know, not nothing fun to eat. That's vegetarian or, you know, I have some friends that are vegans and it's very like, it's very hard 
No yeah. dairy, nothing. It's like, oh man. Yeah, I struggle with that. My mom's a, veg- a vegan. Oh, she's, yeah. she's accommodating. She'll she'll make eggs for everybody, but yeah, it's tough. You're pretty limited. Yeah, as a vegan. But you know, to each his own. Yeah, you make it work. Yeah. What about your uh, first car? Do you remember your first car? Oh man, I do remember my first car. It was it was a truck. It was a small truck. I don't even know what the brand was, but it was like banana yellow. And I got it for 400 bucks from you know, a farmer in outside of Lawrence. Maybe it was like, a, it was a, like a Datsun truck or something like that. Could have been. <laughs> it, it, it was, that seems like a great first car to have a truck in Kansas. Yeah. Yeah. Very quickly. I, um, I could only push start it. <laughs> you had to pop the clutch. I had to pop the clutch and now and, <laughs> and it's flat in Kansas. So it's hard to like find a hill to park. On. So you could only, I could only <laughs> park on Hills and I probably lived like that for three months. Cause I didn't have any bucks to, um, actually fix the starter, fi- fix it. So <laughs> I would always have to park on a hill and yeah. there were times Been there, bro. <laughs> there were times with, you know, I had to, a, and a girlfriend had to, you know, get, get, out out and push. And, get out and push and we had to get that thing going and I would pop the clutch and, See, our um, kids are never going to know some of these like, yeah. like things. There's, I think there's some things that just make you a better person. And <laughs> yeah, having to park on a hill, build character, and go on a date is. I've been there. <laughs> Builds yeah. character. Yeah, it does. Oh, I'm glad to hear you've been there. Yeah, I, my very first car was a, a 1981 Toyota Corolla. Okay, that's a pretty. They were pretty small back in 1981. Yeah, they were little. It was, but it was so fun, you know. And I had like a six this CD changer and I like Weezer and, you know, bare naked ladies and Bush. And like, you know, I would just like roll the windows down and like go driving, you know? And I felt so much freedom Yeah, and it was awesome. Uh, but being broke, yeah, my starter went out and it was like, all right, well, got to pop this clutch. Yeah. Who teaches you that? I I, I don't know. Yeah. There was no YouTube to like Google, like how to start your car when the starter's broken and on a manual, you can't do that. So Yeah. Or an automatic. An automatic, you can't pop your clutch, so. Nobody drove automatics, or very few people drove, drove, yeah. drove automatics. Manuals. And then uh, I remember having to siphon gas. Yep. You know, where you yep. blow into a hose and, you know. Yep. Done that before. <laughs> Are you stealing it? Listen, no comments. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, okay, that's good. That's good. Um, what about... Uh, you said you're not a huge reader, but you do listen to some audiobooks. Yeah. Is there anything that's ever stood out to you as far as a book goes that really inspired you or that maybe you would recommend to somebody like, hey, you should check out this book. It, it'll help you on, on your next phase. Yeah. Um, you know, I, again, I don't like, I don't, I don't love long books, um, but there's a short book I read about a year ago and I passed on to my kids and maybe a couple other people. And it was just called, um, chop wood, carry water. Mm. It's a very short book and not particularly well written, but it kind of, it kind of blends Eastern and Western philosophies. Um, and you know, the premise of it is, um, is just do the work, right? Mm -hmm. Um, if whatever you want to be, just put the work in and, you know, success isn't for a chosen few Success is for the few who choose it. Mm, that's so, good. I like that. That's a, that's a meme right there. Yeah. So it, it, it's written in a way that's simple enough that, you know, my 11 year old could understand it, but I could also understand it and, and appreciate it. And, you know, I was, I was never, I wouldn't say I was ever like a super special kid. I was pretty good at some sports. I was an above average student, but not spectacular. You know, I wasn't, you know, the homecoming king or I wasn't on student council, but, um, but, so, so I don't think success is, is just for, is just for those people. I think, um, um, what I learned from my parents is, you know, you know, get off the highways and drive on the side roads. You know, if you, if you want to have a very, um, normal life, hang out with normal people and do normal things. If you want to have a special life, you know, get off the highways and, and, and do what other people aren't doing, take some risks and, and just put the work in and, and you, you don't have to be a brain surgeon to, to have success. Yeah. I love that. I, it's one of the things that I'm always trying to, I have 11 year old okay. and an eight year old All right, and, uh, and a six year old tomorrow she will be six. Um, wow. but yeah, you know, it's one of those things that my 11 year old, you know, I, I try to always figure out, okay, how can I instill, they come from such a privileged family, right? Like they don't have to, 
live in a tent, you know, in a junkyard somewhere. They don't have to siphon gas. They don't have to, you know, pop the clutch. they don't have to pop the clutch, you know? And so, but how do I instill a good work ethic and, you know, helping them be leaders and make a difference and, you know, stand up for what is right and help those that can help themselves make the best of every situation, stay positive, you know, like work hard, like all those things. And so, you know, I think as a parent, it's one of those things where in a small way, it's like, listen, like, you did a half-assed job on this book report. Like, I know you can do better. Like, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah. let's sit down and like, let's, let's go over it together, you know? And like, let's, let's try to make it the best that it can be. Cause I know that you're better than what, what you did with this book report at 11. Yep. And so, you know, I think those are the, the tough parts about being a parent. I think when you're tr- really intentional, like it, it kind of sucks, Yeah. you know, but you know, like, man, I think this is going to be better in the long run for him, you know? Yeah, you, you can take shortcuts with your kids, you know, from an early age, but you'll pay the price, I think, long term. Yeah. Um, and and well, my my wife is, you know, she put in the time when they were young, and now I feel like she she reaps the rewards of of having a great relationship and pretty easy easy kids in some ways because she was she was willing to discipline them or sit them down and make sure they're putting in the work and, um. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, um, thank you so much for being on the show. Yeah, my pleasure. I really appreciate, great. Um, you know, the conversation and your story and a lot of great wisdom that you've imparted to everybody who listens to this. So um, where can people find more about you or Big Chill? Um, you, you don't seem like someone who's super active on social media. Wow, good guess. <laughs> yeah, I'm not, I'm not on social media, but... Um, you know, if anybody wants to email me, I'm, I'm easy. I'm Orion at big chill.com and big chill is, uh, all over Facebook and Instagram. I believe we're on Twitter as well, but, um, I think mostly on Instagram. Cool. Well, Orion, thanks so much for being on the show. And remember that no matter where you come from, what you've been through, that you have what it takes within you to be successful. And you're not so far from where you want to be.